Hello, I'm Jim Rovira, and this is my introductory lecture on rhyme for my creative writing poetry class. Rhyme has become, for many people, especially people who don't read a lot of poetry, um, the defining characteristic of poetry. If, if lines go together and rhyme, then, it's, then whatever's been written is poetry. But uh, historically, and actually traditionally, that's not always been the case. Um, our epic poetry tradition didn't rely on rhyme at all. And and our great epic poem in English, Milton's Paradise Lost, didn't actually rely on rhyme at all. Um, in fact, Milton had some pretty harsh things to say about rhyme. Here's a quotation from his preface to uh, Paradise Lost. The measure is English heroic verse without rhyme, as that of Homer in Greek and of Virgil in Latin. Rhyme being no necessary adjunct or true ornament of poem or good verse, in longer works especially, but the invention of a barbarous age to set off wretched meter and lame meter. Grace indeed, since by the use of some famous modern poetry, poets carried away by custom, but much to their own vexation, hindrance, and constraint to express many things otherwise, and for the most part worse, than else they would have expressed them. Um, Milton seemed to think that rhyme actually made poetry worse, and actually in many cases that's the case. Um, I think he's being a little harsh on rhyme, though, and uh, many people, have, many poets have used rhyme to great effect over the centuries, and, and Milton was aware of that, too. I think he's just annoyed at what was going on in his time. Um, so we're going to be practicing a number of verse forms that traditionally employ rhyme. So I want you to understand rhyme and how it works. And I want you to take Milton's critique of rhyme um, into account. Um, it forces poets at times who don't use it well to rely upon unnatural expressions or unnatural figures of speech. So you want to think about uh, when you're using rhyme, trying to make your lines sound natural. You, you don't want to draw attention to the rhyme and um, or write the lines for the sake of the rhyme. That's that's when poetry becomes very bad. I think uh, Douglas Adams in one of his Hitchhiker's Guides books suggested that the worst poet who ever lived anywhere in the universe was a young girl in Sussex, England, and I think some part of her body came up through her throat to strangle her before she wrote her poetry down. Um... I don't want anybody to have that kind of reaction to your poetry or to anyone else's. So um, I want you to think n not as rhyme being the most important part of a poem, but as, as something you don't want to know, notice, actually. You don't want to write your lines so that they draw attention to the rhyme, even while you're using it. Um, <clears throat> now, there's there's a few things you need to understand about rhyme and how it works, though, and I'd like to introduce that to you just by introducing to you a vocabulary to talk about rhyme. Um, a, a, a fully rhyming uh, pair of words shares a vowel and consonant sound, like red and bed. Okay, the ed um, sounds are exactly the same in both of those words. But there are also many more slant rhymes, is what some people call them, in that either the <clears throat> vowel sound or the consonant sound match, but not both. When the vowel sounds match, but the consonant sounds do not, that's called assonance. So an example of um, assonance might be red and bet. All right, there are no matching consonant sounds, but the E sound is pretty much the same. Um, an example of consonants would be perhaps coil and cull. So the CL sound are the same in both words, is the same in both words, but the vowel sounds don't match. Um, other types of rhymes might be double rhymes where, where two sets of, uh, of syllables um, match sounds. Uh, triple rhymes, which sound kind of ridiculous, actually. Um, Lord Byron and Don Juan, and yeah, that's how you pronounce the that he pronounced it, Juan, not Juan. And we know that because of the way he rhymed it. Um, and that wasn't a mistake. That was him being funny. Um, also used triple lines, uh, triple rhymes to be very funny. So it's really 
kind of hard to read um, uh, rhymes going across three syllables without them creating a comic effect. If you can do that seriously, um, that's great. <laughs> we'll praise you to the heavens for that. But since Byron has been very hard to write triple triple rhyme and be considered to be writing serious poetry. Um, another example would be rich rhyme, which would be uh, two words that sound exactly the same across all all uh, syllables, like read, as in I plucked a reed from beside the river, and read, as in I I was reading the book yesterday. So, you know, one is spelt R-E-E-D and one is spelt R-E-A-D, but the sounds are exactly the same. Um, and even using the exact same word to rhyme is, is considered an example of rich rhyme. And, and again, that's... I've, I've seen it most effective in comic poetry, um, comic verse, but it, I'm sure it can be used seriously. You just don't want to use that very often. Um, you also need to pay attention to patterns of rhymes. Um, when you're writing uh, four-line stanzas or quatrains, um, there are two typical patterns. There's an A-B-A-B -A -B pattern where the first and third lines rhyme and the second and fourth lines rhyme. And then envelope rhyme, which is an A-B-B-A -B -B -A rhyme pattern in which the first and fourth lines rhyme and the second and third lines rhyme. Um, uh, the the other most important rhyme pattern for the purposes of this class is a couplet, and, and that's two consecutive lines that rhyme. Now, um, again, though, the the important thing about rhyme here isn't that it it always matches perfectly, um, because again, that can produce some very predictable repetitive effects, um, but that the lines sound natural when they're read and not that they're forced to take the shape that they do in order to match the rhyme. Um, and the other thing you have to deal with that kind of um, makes the issue of rhyme a bit complex is regional dialects. We don't all pronounce the same words the same. In, in some parts of the South, the word bed is a two-syllable word. Bed. So, you know, the series of rhymes that would go along with that would be very different. Um... Uh, it's it's okay to write in regional dialect, and some great poetry has been written in regional dialects, say by Langston Hughes or by Robert Burns. Um, so I'm not going to tell you that that's wrong, and I'm certainly not going to tell you that regional dialects are wrong or bad English. Um, it's just that you're going to be studying poetry with people from all over the world. I mean, this very semester where I'm recording these lectures, we have students... Um, uh, in the Middle East, and we have students from all over the country. So, you know, you want to you wanna maybe signal to your readers through spelling or other ways that, that you're using a regional dialect, and, and you certainly will be revealing it by the way you use rhyme. Um, but if you do that, you want to you do it consistently. You don't, don't want to use a generally standard, say, television English uh, throughout your poem and then pick regional uh, pronunciations for, for words here and there. Try to be consistently regional if that's how you're going to write, which again is perfectly acceptable. And if you really wanted to do a good job, you would, you would your syntax should follow regional dialects too, and that would help signal to your readers that that's what you're doing. Um, most important piece of advice I want to leave with you, if you want to write poetry that employs sound effects like rhyme or near rhymes, is to listen. Uh, listen to people. Listen to how they talk. Uh, listen to what they say and how they say it. And yes, that will involve some eavesdropping. I mean, don't listen to what people are saying. Listen to how they say it. Um, you know, how they stress their words, the rhythms of their speech, and how you can adapt that to poetry and make your poetry better. Uh, for the purposes, purposes of this class in which you're studying formal verse, Listening is everything. All formal verse was based upon a, a spoken, a spoken, a tradition of spoken poetry, not just written. So don't be afraid to listen. Thank you.